If you want to build and deploy computer vision models faster, you need to train smarter, not harder. So this is where Lightly Train comes in. It takes care of the heavy lifting for you. It can do all of the pre-training using self-supervised learning so you can focus on your application. Let's dive into the benefits of Lightly Train and how to use it. If you're new to my channel, I have a bunch of resources on robotics and AI, so subscribe for more. And thank you Lightly for sponsoring this video. So why would you want to use Lightly Train? So there's gonna be three main challenges if you don't use Lightly Train. So the first one is that you're gonna need large amounts of labeled data to get started. So for those that have done any sort of large computer vision projects, you know that the time it takes to label all of your data is a very time consuming process. So with Lightly Train, they simplify this for you because now you can actually use self-supervised learning to make sense of your unlabeled data. So you don't need deep machine learning expertise to do this because Lightly Train will fill that gap for you. And the third point is that you're not gonna be limited to multi-purpose backbones, but instead you're gonna get access to the backbones that Lightly Train will make available for you to use. So that's why if you want to speed up your development to deploy computer vision models, you should try out Lightly Train because you get to start training immediately with no labeled data. And also you get to use pre-trained model in just a few lines of code. So this graph right here shows you the difference on the pre-training for YOLO V8 on the Coco dataset. So in purple and blue and gray, there's three different categories. So the purple one is using Lightly Train, for the blue one is using the ImageNet Supervise, and then for the gray one is gonna be no pre-training. So on the x-axis, it tells you the number of images Coco used for fine-tuning, and then the y-axis is the MAP. So what this graph tells you is that the amount of data that you need for fine-tuning is significantly lower if you were to use Lightly Train for the same amount of performance. So, so you can see right here that if we were to use no images from the code dataset for fine-tuning, with Lightly Train, we are already at 15%, whereas with no pre-training, we're all the way down to about three. So if we just increase a little bit, you see that the Lightly Train quickly increases up to 30-something, whereas if we look at no pre-training, we're still stuck around 25. But of course, over time, if you were to add more and more data, you'll eventually reach around the same values of between 40 and 45. But what this graph really tells you is that if you want to save time, meaning you want to do less fine tuning, less fine tuning means it's faster. So if you want to have faster deployment, then Lightly Train is going to get you there more quickly. So to get started, all you need to do is pip install Lightly Train, and then with a few lines of code, you could start your pre-training, and then I'm gonna go over into more details about the different pre-training options that you have. So Lightly Train supports three different pre-training methods. We have distillation, dyno, and sim CLR. So which methods should you choose? So let's go over the pros and cons for each one. So distillation is gonna achieve the best performance on the various tasks compared to dyno or sim CLR. And the advantages of distillation is one it has domain adaptability so it's going to be really good for wide range of applications we have memory efficiency so it's not going to use too much gpu which is good if you're low on uh, gpu memory we also have compute efficiency so it's going to train a smaller student model but still have the nice performance of a large teacher model and then we have no hyperparameter tuning so you could do little to no fine tuning after your pre-training the cons is gonna be the performance limitations. So sometimes the performance is not gonna be that good. So if you're looking for a much higher performance, you might want to consider other models like Dyno or Sim CLR. So when would you wanna use Dyno? So Dyno, again, it has domain adaptability and then also no fine tuning. The cons with Dyno though, is gonna be very compute intensive. And then also sometimes the training could be instable. So you have to be careful how you do your training. And how about Sim CLR? So the main pro of Sim CLR is that it's very good for fine-grained features. So this is particularly good for things like visual quality inspection, where there's subtle differences between the samples you're inspecting. The cons though, however, is gonna be very memory intensive. You're gonna need really large batch sizes, so you need a very high GPU memory. And also the hyperparameter sensitivity is gonna be very sensitive, so you have to be careful how you do your training. So how do you get started with each one? So if you wanna use distillation, you could have just a few lines of Python code and you could get started. So here you can see you have to define your out, your data, your model, and here this is a method that you're using. So in this case, it's distillation. 
if you want to do it the command line way, it's just going to be one line here. So just make sure you have all of the different arguments here, then you should get your training up and running. So if you want to use this method, here's a couple of recommendations. So for the model, one thing to notice is that the knowledge distillation is agnostic to the choice of the student backbone networks. The batch size, we recommend somewhere between 128 and 1536 for knowledge distillation. For the number of epochs, you want to use somewhere between 100 and 3000. But the main thing with distillation is that it actually benefits from longer schedules and models still improve after training for more than 3000 epochs. So for small data sets, like less than 100,000 images, it could still be beneficial to train up to 10,000 epochs. So you have to play around with the numbers to see what gives you the best result. Now, if you want to get started with Dino, again, it's also just a few lines of code. The only difference with the previous one is here now the method is going to be Dino. And the command line is going to be also very similar. You just change the method to be Dino. So a couple of recommendations here is that if you want to choose the batch size, choose something between 256 and 1024 for Dino. This is the suggestion also from the original paper from Dino. And the number of epochs we want to think about is somewhere around 100 to 300 epochs. But the main thing is that with Dino, you also benefit from longer schedules as well. So you may want to still keep training after 300 epochs. So you're going to have to play around and see what works best for you as well. Now, if you're looking to use SimCLR, it's going to be very similar to the lines of code. Just change the method here to be SimCLR. Same thing with the command line. A couple of recommendations is that for the batch size, you want to use a minimum of 256. Although sometimes somewhere between 1024 and 4096 is ideal since it also benefits from larger batch sizes. Now, in terms of the number of epochs, you want to use at least 800 epochs based on the top five linear evaluation results. Based on the top one, though, you want to use up to 3,200 epochs. Also note that using a larger number of epochs will compensate for a smaller batch size. So we just looked at the different models that you can use for pre-training. So to actually set up the epochs and batch sizes, their lightly trained API makes it really easy to set up. So you can see here that all you need to do is just add these two arguments here for the epochs and batch size. So based on the recommendations that we just covered earlier, you could go ahead and update these values here and the pre-training will start running with your configuration. So once you're done doing the training, all of your results are gonna be in the folder here called out slash my experiment. You could choose whatever name you want, but this is the name that we're using here. So you're gonna see this is gonna be the folder structure of the output. You're gonna see that we're gonna have a checkpoints folder here and you're gonna have a last checkpoint. And then for the exported model, you're gonna see there's gonna be a exported last, which is gonna be the last model that I got from training. So there's also a couple of different logging options here. So for the JSON L, it will log the training metrics to a .jsonl file. We also have the tensorboard option, so this is going to log the training metrics to a tensorboard. And then we have the weights and biases option, so it's going to log the training metrics to weights and biases, which will require weights and biases to be installed. There's also a couple of different advanced options you can set. We have the input image resolution, we have the performance optimization. So go ahead and check those out if you want to tweak your training process. All right, if you found this video helpful, give a like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.